Wave motion is that phase of flow in a gravitational field which has not only received the most attention over the greatest number of years, but which has also succumbed most completely to mathematical analysis. Now, waves in general are both unsteady and non-uniform, like those seen here. But we shall deal only with the types that can be made to appear steady by the principle of relative motion. This means that the wave profile must move relatively to the fluid itself with a constant speed known as the celerity C and hence without change in form. The celerity of a wave depends, in addition to gravity, upon three factors. The depth D of the fluid stratum over which it moves, the wavelength lambda, and the wave amplitude A. If the wavelength is large compared to the depth, its effect is negligible, and it is the depth that controls the celerity, as in the case of tides. If, on the contrary, the depth is large compared to the wavelength, it is the wavelength that controls the celerity, as in storm waves in the ocean. Increasing the amplitude of a wave causes its celerity to increase in either case. This effect is limited, however, for a wave crest curves more and more rapidly with increasing amplitude and eventually peaks and breaks. In any case, as seen from the paths of these suspended particles, the celerity of the profile and the locally induced velocity of the water are quite different. Oscillatory waves are readily generated by the harmonic displacement of a wall. They can be of either the shallow water or deep water type, depending upon the ratio of wavelength to depth. If a train of oscillatory waves is reflected by a stationary wall, as at the left, the result is a series of standing waves the profiles of which have no longitudinal but only vertical motion. Standing waves of great length are often formed in harbors. Generation of what is known as a solitary wave requires the displacement of the wall a finite distance in the positive or negative sense. The resulting wave rapidly assumes a stable form and can be reflected repeatedly between the end walls of the channel. What is called a surge entails an abrupt change from one depth to another and requires the continuous displacement of the generating wall in one direction. The same phenomenon results from the abrupt adjustment of a gate in a uniform flow. Surges in which the amplitude is much less than the initial depth involve a train of waves oscillating about the final depth. If the amplitude is nearly as great as the depth, the first wave breaks and gives the front a very turbulent form. As the relative amplitude continues to increase, the celerity increases without limit. Although surges are regularly encountered in estuaries as tidal bores, which are sometimes more than 10 feet high, they are of even greater engineering interest in their standing form called the hydraulic jump. This is an occurrence sometimes purposely brought about by backwater downstream from a spillway or sluice gate to change high velocity to low velocity flow for purposes of structural safety. Since the flow is essentially uniform before and after the breaking front, the relationship between the celerity and the change in depth can readily be evaluated through use of the simplified continuity and impulse momentum relationships for one-dimensional flow with this result. The jump is seen to take place between the supercritical and subcritical regimes without benefit of channel constriction. In fact, the equation for the surge celerity, which now equals the velocity of the oncoming flow, can be written in terms of the Froude number. Evidently, 
F equals 1 when D2 equals D1. Through additional use of the work energy relationship, it will be found that a considerable loss in total head must take place if the other two equations are to be satisfied. This results from the generation of turbulence at the breaking front, the energy of which is rapidly dissipated through viscous shear, as will be described in the next film of the series. You have just seen examples of various flows in which gravity is commonly considered to play an essential role. In the numerical analysis of such problems, G, the fluid weight per unit mass, is treated as a constant because the flows presumably take place under almost identical gravitational conditions. Moreover, the free surface involved is usually that of water under air, the simultaneous motion of the air being ignored because of its much lower density. Now, similar conditions would obtain between two fluids of more nearly the same density such as cold water under warm water, or even cold air under warm air. For example, these two reservoirs contain water under air and salt water under fresh water. If the combined unit is displaced, then much the same wave motion is seen to take place at both interfaces, except that the brine-water combination seems to follow a totally different time scale. What was actually different between the two flows was the effective acceleration of gravity, which we will call G prime. G prime is seen to be proportional to the relative difference in density, or more significantly, to be equal to the differential weight per unit mass. Now, if due account is taken of the fact that both fluids are involved in the acceleration, then much the same procedure can be used in the analysis of flows in which the ratio of fluid densities, rho 1 over rho 2, varies between the limits of nearly zero for air and water, and nearly unity for similar fluids of almost the same composition or temperature. The remaining scenes of this film will be used to show with layers of air and water and brine many of the occurrences already seen, apparently in slow motion. These same phenomena are commonly encountered at natural scale in the atmosphere and in the oceans, lakes, and rivers of the Earth. The flow of cold, foggy air over the high point of a mountain pass into a warmer zone is modeled in a laboratory flume by the discharge of a silt-laden stratum from a reservoir. A fair reproduction of the hydraulic jump that normally forms below a spillway is seen downstream. The abrupt front of a gravity underflow typifies not only the so-called dam break wave, but also the saline tidal wedge in an estuary, or even a dust storm, or an atmospheric cold front. Not only does it behave at a constriction, like water under air, but it forms a surge traveling back upon itself when reflected by a barrier. A wave at the free surface between water and air necessarily involves liquid strata of nearly equal density, as though no density difference existed. A wave at the interface between two such strata, however, will affect them in reciprocal fashion without disturbing the upper surface. The wave celerity, obviously, is then greatly reduced. Wave resistance, such as that encountered by ships, will receive further attention in the final film of this series. For the present, it should be noted that a ship will also be resisted by subsurface waves generated at the interface between layers of different temperature or salinity. As a final scene, there will be modeled at reduced scale waves that are formed in atmospheric layers of different temperature carried as wind over a mountain range. 
it might be remarked in closing this laboratory simulation of natural gravitational effects that not only is the atmosphere reproduced effectively by water and the thermal stratification by layers of different salinity, but for reasons of experimental convenience, the apparently moving body of fluid is actually stationary and the schematic model is being towed through it, suspended, like the camera itself, upside down from a towing carriage at the level of the topmost, here seen as the bottommost, water layer. In the present film, we shall see what effect the actual elasticity, or its reciprocal, the compressibility of a fluid, has upon the patterns of motion that we have studied. Under static conditions, the effect of compressibility is the variation of the fluid density with the pressure load, as may be seen by writing the definition equation for the elastic modulus in the form of a proportion. Even at the bottom of the ocean, however, the relative increase in the density of the water is only a few percent because of the great magnitude of the elastic modulus. The density of a gas, on the contrary, can vary from that of its liquid state under very high pressure to its standard value at atmospheric pressure. And we know that the density of air varies from its standard value at the Earth's surface to essentially zero in outer space. Under non-static conditions, on the other hand, the effect of a local change in pressure is to produce a density change that is propagated elastically from the point of generation with the speed of sound. This speed, which we will call the elastic wave celerity, depends solely upon the elastic modulus and the density of the fluid under consideration. As you will recall from the study of elementary physics, there is a great deal of similarity between waves of different types. In fluid motion in particular, a close analogy exists between gravity waves occurring at the surface of a liquid and elastic waves occurring within either liquid or gaseous media. Thus, whereas the schematic diagram of the propagation of a gravity wave represents a simple change in water depth, the same diagram could be used to represent the propagation of an elastic wave, the wave profile now representing a local change in density. Since elastic waves are usually visible only through use of a rather complex optical system, which we shall illustrate later, this analogy provides a very convenient means of simulating elastic waves by their gravity wave counterparts. Elastic waves in water really correspond to gravity waves of negligible amplitude because the change of density of a liquid is always very small compared with the density itself. A gaseous wave, on the other hand, is without limit in amplitude. It has already been seen that a gravity wave of increasing size will become steeper and finally break. The elastic wave equivalent of such a breaking wave is known as a shock wave, about which more will be said at a later point. As was shown in the first film, the sudden closure of a valve at the end of a long pipe causes an elastic surge to be propagated back and forth between valve and reservoir at sonic speed. At the reservoir end of the pipe, it is always reflected negatively. And at the valve end, it is always reflected positively. As a result of which, the pressure fluctuates rapidly between positive and negative values. The two-dimensional aspects of wave propagation are even more significant than the one-dimensional. If a periodic disturbance exists in a fluid moving at a very small velocity compared with the wave celerity, the series of wavelets that are formed will be practically symmetrical about their source. As the velocity of the flow increases, however, the wavelets will move upstream less rapidly and downstream more rapidly, with the result that the pattern will become more and more asymmetric. When the velocity of the fluid becomes equal to the celerity, the upstream motion will be reduced to zero and the wavelets will all be tangent to a normal line passing through the source. Still further increase in the velocity of the flow will cause all portions of the wavelets to be carried downstream. The lines of tangency subtending an angle which becomes smaller and smaller than 180 degrees as the ratio of fluid velocity to wave celerity increases above unity. Half this angle is known as the Mach angle. 
the reciprocal of its sign is simply the Froude number in the case of gravity waves. In the case of elastic waves, its counterpart is known as the Mach 